Well, good afternoon from the historic market town of Berkeley in Gloucestershire, and thank you for joining us for today's Jenna conversation. We're really thrilled to welcome attendees from around the world to this, the second of our Jenna conversations. I'm Owen Gower, and I'm museum manager at Dr. Jenner's House, the birthplace of vaccination. In 1796, Edward Jenner started a series of clinical trials into the use of a mild disease, cowpox, to protect against the feared disease, smallpox, the world's first vaccine. And in doing so, he gave birth to one of the most important and successful tools in the history of medicine. Vaccination now saves between two and three million lives each and every year. So we share the story of Jenner's work and his legacy from his adult home, the house where he told the world about his discovery. Dr. Jenner's house is maintained by the Jenner Trust, an independent charity in receipt of no regular public funding. Under normal circumstances, we employ the equivalent of just two full-time members of staff, assisted by a number of dedicated volunteers. Today's conversation has been made possible with the support of the National Lottery Heritage Fund via emergency funding designed to help us continue our work despite the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. And whilst this event is free of charge, uh, I do want to say that we are reliant on the generosity of members of the public to enable us to continue our work and to preserve Jenner's house for future generations. If you'd like to find out more about us, you can um, go to our website. You can also sign up to our newsletter to receive notification of other Jenner conversations, or you can make a donation as well. Please visit jennamuseum.com to find out more. Uh, you can also follow us on social media, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook. We're, we're on all of them, generally at Dr. Jenner's house. You can get involved today by posting your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and you can upvote those questions you'd most like to see answers to. If you're tweeting about this conversation, please use the hashtag Jenner Conversations. If you need any assistance, please contact us directly through the chat function. And my colleague Kasia is working hard behind the scenes to ensure everything runs smoothly today. At the end of the discussion, you'll be invited to take part in a short survey. It should only take you about five minutes to complete and would be much appreciated as it helps us to develop our programmes. So writing at some point before his death in 1823, Edward Jenner noted, nothing is recorded or recounted of vaccination, but its imperfections. Its benefits are passed by and are often forgotten. We might sometimes feel as if those words could have been written today, has an increasingly digital society changed the way we communicate vaccine information? How should we be dealing with misinformation? Is there a difference between being anti-anti-vaccination and being pro-vaccination? Joining us for today's Jenna conversation, we have Imran Ahmed, CEO of the Centre for Countering Digital Hate, Helen Bedford, Professor of Children's Health at UCL Great Ormond Street Institute of Child Health, and Dr Tonya Thomas, the Vaccine Knowledge Project Manager at the Oxford Vaccine Group. Chairing today's discussion is Dr. Richard Horton, Editor-in-Chief of The Lancet. So over to you, Richard. Thank you very much indeed, Owen. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you uh, this afternoon. Uh, and I'm honored to be able to uh, introduce our panel of really fantastic speakers. That there's a very interesting coincidence that Jenner's last year, 1823, was also the year when Thomas Wackley founded The Lancet, uh, so almost 200 years ago. Uh, we've got three tremendous guests today who've already been introduced to you, and perhaps they can reveal themselves um, so you, you can see them in all their glory. Helen, Imran, and Tonya. Very good. Uh, what I'd like to do um, first of all, so everybody understands a little bit about uh, the background of our three guests, is to get each of you just to uh, give us a little thumbnail sketch, please, uh, of the work that you're doing um, and the relevance of it to the question that we're discussing this afternoon. So Imran, if I could come to you, the Center for Countering Digital Hate, tell us about that. Well, uh, hi, my name is Imran Ahmed. I'm, I, I found and I run the Center for Countering Digital Hate. We were set up to look at the way in which misinformation and identity-based hate were being instrumentalized by political actors uh, to change the precepts upon which we, we consider the world around us and, um, and were affecting our liberal democracy in profound and, and disturbing ways. 
Um, in doing so, we've studied the way in which misinformation and hate are proselytized in digital spaces in which people's views are hardened and changed. And um, when coronavirus came along, it was very easy for us to switch to it, in part because a lot of the hate actors that we were looking at had sought to instrumentalize coronavirus way before most of us in, uh, in civil society had realized that this was going to be the issue that defined 2020. So um, we now uh, are working on trying to disrupt the networks that proselytize um, conspiracism and misinformation. Well, thanks, Imran, and we'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a moment. Um, let me turn to Helen. Um, you're a professor of children's health at the Institute of Child Health. Helen, tell us a little bit about your work. Yes, that's right. So I'm a researcher and educator in vaccination, um, and I came on the scene just literally a couple of years before the introduction of MMR vaccine in the late 80s. And we did a large study looking at the determinants of vaccine uptake. And interestingly, at that time, there was literally a handful of papers, of research papers that have been done looking at attitudes to vaccination. And now, of course, there's complete explosion in that sort of research. So I continue to do that, um, but also importantly, uh, speak direct to the public about immunization and educate, talk to train health professionals, um, particularly about how to talk to parents about vaccination. Lovely, thank you, Helen. And Tonya, um, at the Oxford Vaccine Group, very much in the news um, of late. Tell us a little bit about what you do as a knowledge project manager. Yeah, so um, I'm Tonya. I'm the uh, public engagement lead for Oxford Vaccine Group. Um, so there I mainly focus on producing content to address the concerns about vaccination um, and vaccine safety that we see in the media. Um, so primarily I do this through the Vaccine Knowledge Project, as you mentioned. Uh, this is a website that was set up by the director of Oxford Vaccine Group, uh, Professor Andrew Pollard, uh, quite a few years ago now. Um, and it focuses on um, providing evidence-based information for the public and also for healthcare professionals um, about vaccines. So as part of my role, um, I research online trends in uh, vaccine attitudes uh, and then try to engage with the most common public concerns through our website um, and via social media as well. Um, most recently, as, as you highlighted, I've been focusing on the, uh, the vaccine study um, that we've been running from Oxford Vaccine Group and the Jenner Institute. So um, working on preparing uh, information about the vaccine trials um, in a format that's understandable uh, for the public and also you know, for other key stakeholders. That's lovely, thank you, Tonya. Um, now the title of the discussion this afternoon is being pro-vaccination in a digital world, but perhaps, I, actually I'd like to start with you, Tonya, because before we get into the details of, of these issues, perhaps we should just explain where we are in the world um, in regards to developing a coronavirus vaccine. We've had Donald Trump, claim that maybe we could have a vaccine before the November the 3rd election in the United States. Um, we've had other speculations about sometime next year. Tell us how many vaccines are out there and what's the progress like? Yeah, of course. So, I mean, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? When will we have a vaccine it is what I get asked all the time. Um, and of course, that's the question that's impossible to answer. Um, so I'll, I'll try my best. Um, there are a huge number of teams across the world working on this, um, you know, trying to develop a vaccine. It's kind of one of the big, biggest pushes we've ever seen. Um, and there are in preclinical studies, I think almost 200 vaccines, um, which is exceptional. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what the audience um, we've got is today, but just to give a quick overview, preclinical studies is where um, we would test a vaccine or a drug um, in animal models or cell models before we can um, progress to clinical studies where we would test the vaccine in people. Um, so there are also a significant number of vaccines that have made it into clinical studies already. Um, and the Oxford vaccine, along with I think eight other vaccines, have made it to phase three clinical studies, which is... Uh, a huge achievement already um, to think that we only started on this early this year. Um, the phase three clinical studies, the big question that we're asking here is, 
do the vaccines work to protect people against the coronavirus? So um, the challenge with this is that we need enough people um, who are taking part in the studies to actually be infected with the coronavirus um, to enable us to see whether there are, is a difference between the groups of people who have received the vaccine um, and those who have received a control vaccine. Um, and that's why it's so hard for us to answer because we just don't know when we'll get there. Um, you know, obviously we're confident that we will get there, um, but I really, really couldn't put a time on it. No, no, but probably not in October. Um, it's not looking likely because we're two weeks from there. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, well, let's let's take an optimistic um, position and say that we've got these nine vaccines in phase three trials and a whole bunch, 130, maybe more in various stages of development. Um, and let's say we are likely to have a vaccine um, at some point in the future. Helen, what do you think we need to be doing now? And, and the, by we, I, I, I don't restrict this to just health professionals, but I mean, we as a society, um, what do you think we should be focusing on for preparing for a vaccine, preparing the public for a vaccine? Uh, very good question. Uh, we should get the public on board, first of all. So we need to understand public views about the disease, about the potential vaccine, because we need to have a really good communication strategy, um, a communication strategy that answers, pe answers people's issues, questions, concerns, um, and prepares them for this vaccination. Um, it needs to be meaningful communication, you know, straightforward, transparent, clear, um, with the information we know, the information we don't know, and how we're going to find out what we don't know. But also, because this is likely to be large-scale vaccine programs, we need to think about how we're going to actually uh, offer vaccines. So, I mean, it's likely that it would need to be offered in places other than medical establishments. So, you know, wider, broader reach to get right to the communities to make sure that they have, there is equitable access to it. No, that's great. And, and, you know, this issue of a communication strategy, which you underline, sometimes I always think communications comes at the end. People think about communications too late. And actually, we need to be thinking about communication now. Um, well, and a, 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 yeah, absolutely. Sorry, yeah. I mean, one of the issues that's emerged in the media is that people are concerned that this appears to be a rushed in vaccine mm. and that it might be sidestepping all the safety requirements. And right now, we, we should be educating people more about um, vaccine development and the stages that have gone through and reassuring them that it's absolutely, you know, going through all the hoops, that nothing is being missed. So even without a vaccine being available, we could do that now. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, given that, um, Imran, this threat of digital misinformation um, I don't trawl the internet looking for that digital misinformation, but there's a lot of it out there. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're most worried about with respect to the threats of that misinformation. Well, I mean, it's clear that there is a threat because we can see that in the, in the outputs, which are that vaccine hesitancy around the coronavirus vaccine uh, appear to be fairly high in both the UK and the US, and that's over a sustained period. We've now done longitudinal tracking and seen that those it's worsening. So we're, 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 we're already losing a war that we haven't even started uh, mm. our first skirmishes in. Uh, the first thing is that there is a threat. And, you know, communications quite often can be about what we can say, but actually communications has to exist in, we're communicating to people who exist in the real world, and there is a counterforce. And that's really hard for us to imagine sometimes. There are people out there who wish to persuade people that vaccines don't work because it seems so counterthetical, so, so, so absurd to us mm. that we forget that there is a cogent, organized, disciplined, effective, communications force countering the idea that vaccines are good and that we should take the coronavirus vaccine to contain the threat of the pandemic. 
And, um, you know, liberals like to blame ourselves quite often. So, you know, it's, it's that we, we, it's, we didn't communicate well enough. We, we fail to acknowledge that there is an opponent. And it's the nature of that opponent that makes it so interesting that if you, if, when we track across to COVID disinformation, it's incredibly similar to the networks that we see uh, spreading identity-based hate or climate denial or other types of uh, malignant uh, social, uh, social media behavior. Mm. And that's because they rely upon similar systems and culture that enables them to exist, whether it's the algorithmic privileging of misinformation over fact on social media platforms, um, whether it's the actors themselves. And I mean, a good example was David Icke, who we chose as a synecdoche of that, uh, of uh, an exemplar of the, 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 the nexus between identity-based hate and uh, misinformation. Um, and we create political, economic, and social costs for the actors, systems, and culture within the system. So we are, you know, we, we, we see ourselves very much as a, as, as a, uh, an NGO that just disrupts. We're not, we, we're not going out there and telling everyone, this is what we know, aren't we? Uh, you know, th isn't the system interesting to look at? We are seeking to disrupt it uh, through our work. Um, and also to counter some of the methods that they're using. So the weaponization of the scientific method, for example. So we see in terms of the threat against us that the very, that the very scientific method itself, the fact that as the evidence emerges, that our, the balance, uh, our, our balanced judgments uh, evolve and change, that they say, well, they used to say this, now they say this, just shows that they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. Um, it's, it's outright lies, which we find very difficult to counter because as soon as we hear someone lie, we accept that frame and we, 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 we fail to reframe. So they say it's a, you know, it's, it's, um, it, it is, it's, a, it's a real challenge for us to actually get our message out. And um, the other thing is that we, we tend to battle on the platforms when we do battle. So, you know, for most of the time we think, well, if there's a social media problem, we've got to fight it on social media. Well, that's nonsense. You don't fight an asymmetric threat by literally going onto the platform that, that they have strength on and that you're weakest on because you haven't really worked out how to use digital spaces. We have to understand, well, what are the methods and means by which we counter that threat? So there is a threat. It's, it's clear significant. Um, we, we have some understanding of the nature of that threat, but I think our responses to it to date uh, have been poor. Well, that's very interesting, Imran, because that's, I mean, that's counterintuitive to me. So if, I, if I'm on Twitter and I see somebody make an anti-vaccine uh, statement, um, should I respond to that and engage them uh, and try and convince them that they're talking nonsense or there's no evidence behind their statement? Um, let's talk, the three of us, about how we, how we do respond to this misinformation because then I'm confused. I don't know what tools I should be using to address this. Um, if I don't engage on the platform that they're um, engaging, um, what's the best way to start? Tonya, what, from your position, actually right on the front lines um, dealing with the corona vaccine and with the Oxford group, well, how do you engage with skeptics and anti-vaxxers? Yeah, so um, this is not just a recent issue that we've been dealing with. Obviously, having the Vaccine Knowledge Project, um, you know, for many years, we've been trying to address this problem. Um, and I think social listening, as Imran has already mentioned, is really important to get a good understanding of what the, the landscape is like. Um, and, you know, trying to look for patterns and trends in the concerns that people have. Um, and that's the way that we inform the content we produce for our website um, and also the content that, that we share on, on our social media um, platforms. Uh, I suppose one of the challenges with, with using social media is the people that follow Oxford Vaccine Group are probably not the people <laughs> that we, we need to be convincing. Um, and that, that is one um, area that I think, um, you know, we need to be improving on the, the thing with the lots of the these strong opposition groups is that they're very very experienced in using social media and all the marketing tools um, needed to really get their message out um, and I think it's an interesting strategy from Imran that you know we don't necessarily need to be using those and I think that's perhaps something that we need to um, you know fo focus on more because um, it's true that we're not we're not so good at using social media. Um, it's not our area of expertise. It's not something we 
you know we spend our lives on um you know and test out different strategies and things so where do our our um you know where wh what areas can we actually um use to our advantage where do we feel confident i think it's important to have two-way um, communication so the kind of old style science communication where you know perhaps someone does a public lecture once a year um, mm. to a particular audience is not the way to go um, but so we need a two-way conversation but it doesn't necessarily need to be via the same platform so listening to social media but then actually using a website which is you know verified and um supported by the world health organization because that's an area where we we are comfortable um in sharing information um so I see, yeah that's the way we we're approaching it at, at oxford vaccine group at the moment thanks tonya yeah helen what does your experience and the evidence tell us about how we uh, address misinformation well, i think the first thing to say is that anti-vaccine sentiment is very loud but it's not actually very large in you know, numerically, um, vaccine uptake in this country is really robust. It's over 90%, and we mustn't forget that. And, and studies that Public Health England do every few years, tracking studies, show that parents are confident in vaccines. You know, the overwhelming majority of them, over 90%, say they go along and get their children immunised. Um, so that's the first thing to say. So I, th I don't think we should um, make, it, make it a bigger thing than it really is. I think in... Mm getting messages out there. We need to talk to people who are maybe on the fence or undecided rather than the anti-vaxxers per se. So it's getting the strong messages out to the people who are already on board, if you like. Um, you, you will all be familiar with the term vaccine hesitancy. Um, I have a little bit of a kind of thing about it because, you know, there's about five or six different definitions circulating all around. But hesitant to me means I don't know what to do. I'm undecided. Mm. So it's that audience that we need to talk to, to, you know, get them to voice their concerns and address those appropriately, um, rather than trying to, to, to uh, communicate always with the people with the most, you know, the, the really extreme views who just simply are not going to listen. So it's the people that, you know, may be on the fence. That's very interesting. So you could sort of divide the world up into a, a, a relatively small group of strong anti-vaccination opponents, um, a group uh, that might actually be reasonably sized of, of people who are perfectly confident about the safety and effectiveness and importance of vaccines, and then this group in the middle who are hearing these arguments around, and they're, they're the sort of danger group because they could be swayed by the anti-vaccine, and we need to be giving we need to be giving confidence to, to that group that the science is secure, um, the evidence is uh, robust and reliable. Absolutely. And we know, yeah. you know, there is evidence okay. to show that health professionals are really important in talking to parents and that parents trust them. They do. Yeah. And they trust the NHS, which is, you know, a real feather in our cap. Yeah. If the NHS says something's OK, parents. Yeah. Okay. But, Go but, on. um, uh, I was looking at a, at, at a statistic, that I, this is something that uh, Heidi Larson said last week when she launched her uh, vaccine confidence project, uh, which, which we published um, last week. And she said that in March of this year, 5% of people um, would not take a coronavirus vaccine, would not receive the coronavirus vaccine. But by June of this year, that figure had increased to 15%. Well, I mean, these are opinion polls. You know, there isn't a vaccine yet. No. What you need when you're um, encouraging people to take up a vaccine is to have information about the disease. And this is a new disease which we're learning about, you know, if not every day, certainly every week and about the vaccine. And we can't tell people about safety and efficacy and long-term protection because we don't know that. Um, as an example, some years ago, we did a study where we asked uh, about 2,000 parents about a number of vaccines that actually haven't been introduced yet and whether they would have them. We gave them information about the diseases. And 68% of them said they, they would take up a pneumococcal vaccine. So pneumococcal vaccine protects against meningitis and pneumonia uptake of that is you know over 90 percent now so it's it's a it's difficult asking people a hypothetical question 
Yeah. Imran, do we actually know who our opponents are? Do we know who, who the people who are purveying these uh, anti-vaccine messages are? Because if we do, um, could we get, there's been a lot of discussion about Facebook and Twitter and do social media companies have a responsibility to target these individuals, to close them down? Um, do we have a list of opponents who we could uh, go to these tech companies with and try and persuade them to, to silence them? Um, yeah, we do. I mean, I'm not saying I've got a deck of cards with various faces on it, uh, but <laughs> we actually do. Uh, so, I mean, th th there are actors that we know are particularly active. And I mean, we, at the CCBH, we are very specific. We, we target those that we know we can create an example of uh, and create precedent. So the problem for us at the moment is that social media companies are ambivalent as to the spread of misinformation on their platforms. On the one hand, they don't like the reputational damage, but on the other hand, they like having people who are engaged in their platforms and misinformation is more engaging than facts. So, you know, if you go online, you, you tend not to reply to the NHS or to the WHO when they tweet or even retweet or, or, or like them. But if you see someone spouting misinformation, you'll engage with it. Now on a platform whose only function is to keep you on that platform. So you can have advertising serve which is the underlying in, sort of inescapable logic of those platforms. And in which you don't receive a timeline, you receive an algorithmically generated list of content with a maximum probability of keeping you on that platform and scrolling down so you can have more adverts. They will prioritize misinformation because it is more engaging and because we ourselves have indicated it's engaging by engaging with it. Which is why we've had programs like Don't Feed the Trolls and Don't Spread the Virus, behave, which are based on behavioral insights and trying to understand, well, how do we start to remove that temptation to give the system uh, a, a sort of a heads up that this might be interesting and therefore to be amplified? And I think in that respect, Helen's very right that what, what this is about is about the visibility rather than necessarily the, uh, the quantum. So it's about the, the, the visibility of misinformation versus the number of people who are necessarily generating it. So when it comes to those actors, what we've sought to do is show that the social media companies don't really and they claim Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which is a US act, which says that they, they are platforms and not publishers, which gives them protections against, uh, against certain types of uh, lawsuits, but also the First Amendment stops them from, from removing misinformation. Well, we've shown that not to be true because they have taken down people at our urging when we've created a voluble enough case. Uh, and that's one thing the CCDH is good at doing. We're good at getting a lot of attention to the fact that they tolerate misinformation on their platform uh, uh, being spread unabated. So there are there are there are means that we have for, for dealing with those actors, and we are we, you know we we work on that day in day out. So let me just turn to Tonya now because you've just been through an experience um, in Oxford, of course, where a huge amount of um, public discussion about the fact that the, the Oxford trials um, were suspended uh, with a patient who had developed um, an illness. And of course, th that suspension go showed beautifully the priority that you were putting on safety. Um, how was that experience? Tell us a little bit about that experience from your point of view in terms of the media reaction, um, how you developed a communications plan to uh, respond to that, because clearly the, I did see some responses as, as being alarmist, whereas actually it was a, a reason to be more confident in the development of the vaccine and the uh, conduct of the trial. Tell us a little bit about how you handled that. Yeah, so the important thing I think in these kind of situations um, is getting the accurate information out there um, and trying to reassure people. And I think this feeds into um, the question that you just asked Imran. Um, and when there is a lot of misinformation um, going around that, as you say, is, is often quite alarmist, um, it can feel tempting to respond to that 
um, you know, as an opponent and, and you know, try and mm. attack that. But actually, that's not necessarily always the best, um, you know, way to go. And I think sometimes, particularly with the suggestions of um, removing people from social media, if you've got this group who are hesitant and unsure, um, as Helen suggested, this large group of people that we're trying to target, um, whether it's on the general anti-vax views or, you know, with particular incidents um, with studies, uh, vaccine trials, um, removing the source of information that they are potentially trusting more than um, you know the scientists which is often the case um, you know how does that look if you're trying to make a decision about what's accurate and what's not if you know something's been taken down by the government or you know an organization whoever it is that's removing it then you think oh i wonder is, is there a an that incentive be behind that exactly yeah, yeah. so um, i think from our side it's important to focus on getting the, the accurate information out there with you know within the the regulatory constraints that you have because obviously um with this kind of research the there are a lot of um regulatory and confidentiality issues that we need to consider as well um so it's getting the right messages across um, and also just i think it, this provides a really really good opportunity to educate people about the process of vaccine development um, and it's something that is always targeted by anti-vaxxers uh, you know are vaccines safe what's been done to test this and we're right in the middle of this huge development process um, and you know it's, it's just an amazing opportunity for us to be able to engage in conversations with the public about how vaccine development actually works all of these safety procedures that we go through that as you say are positive um, and it's mm. what people want us to to be mm -hmm. doing um, mm. and we really have this opportunity to do it i think one of the challenges um, that we do face at the moment is the people who are most engaged in these processes right now um, and have the information um, to be able to share with the public are also the most busy people in the world at the moment and um, so we need to engage the whole scientific community and try and get you know um, these kind of communication strategies out as Helen said before we have a vaccine so that um, you know people are already being educated about the vaccine development process um, before we get there I yeah. think that's kind of the key no that's lovely that's a lovely lovely answer um, Helen, one of the questions that I get asked a lot is, um, we seem to be moving very fast. And one, one, of the, um, one of the concerns that gets raised is, are we moving too fast? I, I mean, I, you'll know this better than me, but I think it's right to say that it takes about seven to eight years to go from preclinical development to a fully licensed and available vaccine, normally, on average, on average. And here we are, eight, nine months into a pandemic, and we've got nine candidate vaccines in phase three trials. It's astonishing. Um, and, and then the question I, I get asked is, well, are we cutting corners? How do we, and clearly we're not. We, we know, those of us on this, on this um, call know that we're not cutting corners far from it. But that's a concern. How do we get this message across that being fast isn't necessarily meaning that we're lowering our quality uh, thresholds. Because well, it it's, it's a real concern I, I'm picking up. No, it is a concern. Um, and I think, as Tony said, we've got to be very clear about the process of vaccine development and be open and honest about, yes, OK, this is being brought in quickly, but none, mm. of, the, none of the steps are being sidestepped. You know, all the regulatory processes have to be met. I think Tony could probably address this question better than I could, actually, as she's... Okay, it's on you. Yeah, it. Take, take it away. <laughs> Sorry, I, I faced out slightly then, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't as, worry. That's as right. Helen was answering, my mind just wandered. Um, so it's, we were talking about the vaccine trials. It's about whether oh, and it's we're too going quick. too fast. It's too quick. Whether yes, of course. Yeah, another question that I get asked very often, actually. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, so I suppose there are pros and cons to being um, in the middle of a pandemic and trying to develop a vaccine. Um, there are certainly benefits because there's a lot more funding available. Um, a lot more people are, have been, um, you know, enabled to be able to work on this. Um, so there are obviously these positives which allow us to be able to um, move quicker than we usually usually would. Um, so obviously all of the research teams around the world that are currently working on this vaccine would usually be working on other research. Um, whether that's 
primarily vaccine research, research and some, in some cases, um, different types of research altogether. Um, but what we've been able to do is put down all of that other work and focus mm. entirely on one specific problem. Um, and so obviously that speeds up things um, hugely. But at the same time as the researchers are doing that, all the support teams are doing the same thing. So the funding bodies, the regulatory agencies, um, the journals, I'm sure, as well, um, mm. are also putting their focus into one particular area, um, and that enables us, um, you know, to to move quicker than we usually would. Like, for example, having um, committee meetings on a Sunday evening uh, to review some data so that we can, you know, start clinical appointments on a Monday. I mean, yeah. you know, that doesn't usually happen. Usually, you send off the information and it's reviewed for a few weeks, and then you have a meeting to discuss it and all of these processes all the way along, um, uh, you know, we're still going through exactly the same steps that we normally go through and the day-to-day -day work that's being done is the same. Um, it's just that these um, supporting um, teams are enabling, enabling it to be done much quicker um, and the teams themselves have grown as well in size. So it, yeah. it's explaining these kind of things, but the there are absolutely no corners being cut and there's no steps being um, being missed out. Um, no, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, let, let me, I want to come to Imran because, well, in fact, all of you, because we're not having this discussion in, um, in a vacuum. We're having this discussion at a particular political moment. And I've never, I don't think I've ever lived at a time where there's been such political divisiveness, mistrust of elites, um, whether they be in politics or science, um, political polarization, um, extremism of almost all kinds in society. And that, that collapse of, maybe that's too strong a word, but certainly erosion of trust um, affects people's views about the evidence, about anything. Um, and vaccines are certainly one example of that. So Imran, in your experience um, at the Center for Countering Digital Hate, what about that political context? Do you think that that political context is making this worse or is it an irrelevance? So the, the, I mean, I, I, the political context is, and the, the, the particular political forces that I think, you know, we don't need to name them, but we know who they are. Mm. Uh, we talk about being uh, the undermining the fundamental tenets of the Enlightenment, whether it's science or it's um, tolerance or anything else, um, that we know who those actors are. And we know that they're doing very well in Western democracies. In fact, they're doing very well around the world right now. Um, they tend to exhibit a constellation of beliefs that we're all very familiar with. We know that climate denial goes alongside misogyny, goes alongside identity-based hate, goes alongside vaccine denial. We, we see the same actors doing it again and again and again. Um, and there, I think it's only an understanding why it is that it's so attractive for them to adopt those particular policies. and and and. and it, Often it's not about adopting the policies, it's about these loose alliances of interest with those, with those um, actors that, yeah. we, that we can understand it. Well, they, they provide three key benefits to those political actors. One is that they provide armies that will go out there and harangue the enemies of the, their political enemies. So if, it's, if the political enemies happen to be scientists today, then it'll be scientists that they harangue. They'll go after the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, they'll go mm -hmm. after Gavi, they'll go after the CDC. They, they will go and promote that political actor's interests and they will also help to reshape the corpus of knowledge that we all accept as being normal. So they will literally reshape our understanding of the world around us by using, we know, misinformation in a way that, that, that starts to change what mm. we think are the precepts and tenets of, of, of our understanding of, of, of society and science. So because that is such an attractive package to offer to any politician, from the fringe that hasn't been able to achieve power before. Of course, this is the political context that we see emerge. Yeah. And it's only by disrupting the advantages that are given to them by those digital actors, in, and they're digital primarily, um, mm. and that we can start to change the political context. So we need to remove the incentive of working with those forces. And, okay. and part of it is going to be fighting back against, the, against vaccine denial. Okay, great answer. Um, it's, it's, in other words, it's a lot more complex than maybe we, uh, than we think. 
I want to come to Helen. There's, we've got some great questions coming in, and I want to make sure that we, um, we uh, engage our audience. Um, so this question from Stephen Morris. Um, rather than trying to engage with social media, would it be better to have a much more general public health campaign via news, press, and TV ads, as was used in the as was used for AIDS in the 1980s and 90s? And those of us of a certain age, and I'm certainly of a certain <laughs> age, remember those incredibly effective public health campaigns. Helen, what do you think? I think we need to tackle this. Um, using multiple approaches, if you like. We need to make sure that our health professionals are really well informed so they can have conversations with parents. But also, I do think um, a, a, a campaign of that description might be very useful. Um, clearly, you know, how you give the messages has to be the right tone. So it can't be too frightening. You know, mm. there's a level that, that you have to achieve. But I think, yes, I think it's, it needs to come from multiple sources not just um, through the health service. And yeah, we that's what we know parents want. They want these messages from different different places. And Helen, I don't know if I'm sh sure you are on the inside track. Do you know, are, are, um, is Public Health England or now the National Institute of Health Protection, is it developing, beginning to develop these communication campaigns, beginning to think about how they're going to uh, talk to the public about these matters? Course. It's happening. Of course. Good. Good. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Um, now, here's a here's a here's a question, um, uh, and this is from Georgina Stevens. Thank you, Georgina. Um, and you're asking. This is a super question because it goes to the heart of um, who's at risk of uh, COVID-19. Will the vaccine be more effective at protecting vulnerable people, or or for prevention of the virus? protection against the virus. I guess the question is whether um, uh, is about preventing the, the disease, the, getting the infection, or I think what she's saying is, is it going to prevent the infection or prevent the disease? So she's taught, I think the key point here is vulnerable people. We know who the vulnerable people are, older people in society, people with chronic diseases, uh, black, Asian, minority, ethnic populations, people on the front lines, whether in healthcare or schools or transportation or food systems. Um, we want to protect them first. Is the vaccine going to be equally effective in all those groups? Um, who would like to take that one on? I think that uh, will be unclear at the moment yet, yeah, whether it will prevent infection or whether it will just prevent severe disease. Perhaps mm. Tonya's got the inside track on that. Yeah. Um, I don't I don't have the inside track, but I can I suppose I can um think through the question in a bit more detail. Um so obviously um the the kind of gold standard if we want to do everything would be to prevent um transmission of the virus uh, as well as to prevent severe disease. Um I mean the one feeds into the other because if you're preventing transmission then um you are preventing from anyone from being anyone from becoming infected therefore developing severe disease um, but let, if we just focus on this you know severe disease in people who are vulnerable um, that's the main thing that we want to prevent here um, because we want to prevent the number of people going into hospital um, you know and obviously dying or having very serious complications from this disease so as a minimum um, that's what we're aiming for and it might be that the first vaccines that you know uh, are licensed for use um, mainly prevent severe disease, but they have less of an effect um, in protecting um, from infection. Mm. Um, and, and that might be the case to start with. Um, mm. But as we move forward, it's likely that more vaccines will, will be developed and potentially um, they may have more, more of an effect on, um, on transmission. Um, the question about protecting vulnerable people and seeing how well vaccines work in different groups, um, uh, certainly for our study and um, I'm sure for other studies as well, we're testing the vaccine in different age groups yeah. um, to see how well it works in older people as well as younger yeah. people, because um, that, that is often um, the case with vaccines that they don't work so well in older people. So we want to understand, um, you know, whether perhaps a higher dose is needed in, a, in older people or multiple doses um, in order to be able to protect them. Um, and in terms of whether those vulnerable people would get the vaccine 
first that's another question that often um comes up obviously that's a policy decision and it's not not a decision for the researchers but um i would imagine that people who are most vulnerable such as older people people with underlying conditions healthcare workers yeah. those that, that are more at risk of coming into contact with the virus um are potentially more likely to to have access to it first yeah that's good thank you very much tonya imran a specific question from for you here from uh, Steve Pritchard. Steve, thanks for your question. Um, and he was interested in your comments about fighting on uh, unequal terms with social media. And he's, he asked this, given that social media channels operated by universities and funders are typically very poorly resourced, should we be instead looking to partner with key social media influencers who better understand the social media landscape? Partnerships with people with money. I, th I think it's a good idea that so I mean, of course the official ch I mean, everyone's told you have to have an Instagram page uh, or an Instagram channel why I mean that's the question I always ask is, I mean, what's the point if 50 people follow it and you spend huge amounts of energy thinking well you know should we use this image and what should our meme be today it's pointless uh, because the other side are getting exposure which is enormous I mean the views on I always say look at a Katie Hopkins video and then look at an NHS video and see who's got more views um, and yeah. that's the question that we, ha we have to ask ourselves is where's our resource best spent um, and I come at this uh, having spent eight years as a political advisor to the uh, opposition uh, in Parliament and we often knew that we were in an asymmetric battle when it came to uh, spend, for example. So we had a we had lots and lots of volunteers and members that would go and knock on doors. Well, what does the NHS have? It has lots and lots of people who are embedded in communities that have high social value and are respected by lots and lots of people. And so actually, there's a, there's a phenomenal army of people to go out there communication this is I and mean, if we start to think about this is we're trying to persuade human beings rather than we're mm. trying to a channel right. you know trying to right. sort of obviate the threat that's coming from a particular channel a particular space i mean the digital world and the and, and the and the offline world they are intermediated by humans so how do we how do we persuade human beings and and then we start to get into interesting spaces which are you, you start to think to yourself well okay you said that social media contains a lot of misinformation well social media also has the bbc the Guardian mm. has lots of good sources of information. It has the WHO. How mm. do you how do you start to work out? Well, when people say they get information from social media, mm. does that mean they're getting it from David Icke or you know my auntie who tells me that in Afghanistan we have a yeah. cure for coronavirus already? And I'm yeah. like, or how do you get it from the BBC and a, and a, and a, and a more sort of reputable source? So. Yeah. I think that that's, it, it, we, we have to just be a little bit more sophisticated about thinking about how we persuade people, not necessarily win that battle on that particular yeah. channel. Why yeah, I mean, this goes to Helen's point that we've got to be very careful not to exaggerate this. Um, because if we do, then we're, we're creating um, a problem that uh, is there, but might not be as big as we, we think it is. Actually, um, Helen, I want to come with you. There's an, an anonymous attendee um, who's uh, raised this point um, and says this. Jeremy Farrer, um, those of you who don't know, is director of uh, Wellcome Trust um, and a very prominent voice uh, in the public discussion about COVID-19, a member of the Scientific Advisory Group on Emergencies. Jeremy Farrer has pointed attention to the potential damage done by the images that we use on social media related, relating to health and in particular to vaccination, the screaming baby or wincing adult, etc. How important do the panel believe it is to change the way we depict vaccination in mitigating anti-vaccination programs? Helen, what do you think about that? Well, I feel I agree very strongly that a lot of the images you see are of crying babies, needles going in odd places, all sorts of things. Uh, you don't need to show a picture of somebody being vaccinated to get the message over that vaccines create healthy populations. Um, and certainly, from my perspective, if I'm writing an article and um, I, get, I get to see the proof and the image that's going with it is some horrible image, I say, can you change it and just put a healthy child there? I think this is very important. I don't know how much impact it would have on the anti-vaxxer movement, but it may make those people on the fence, the hesitants, a bit more confident. Very good, very good. What do you think, Tonya? How do you depict, uh, when you're thinking about communicating about the Oxford vaccine, is this something you think about a lot? 
actually, I'm just going to um, add to my question because it was very interesting. When the Russian vaccine study came out, um, I, I listened into the press conference they held in Mo Moscow, and they were claiming that their vaccine was better than the Oxford vaccine. And the reason they claimed that was that they said that we know more about the human adenovirus vector than we know about the chimpanzee adenovirus vector, which is, of course, the basis for the Oxford vaccine. So they, in these, again, these images, chimpanzee versus human adenovirus vaccine, do you want to give your, do you want to have a chimpanzee-based vaccine or do you want to have a human? You know, th these, this is, this is where it all gets um, totally irrational. And I was very surprised to hear that in the press conference at the launch of a, of a vaccine study, but they did it. So your thoughts? No, that's interesting. Um, so, I mean, I can't comment on the Russian vaccine because I'm no. not hugely <laughs> up to speed on, the, on their work. Um, but in terms of thinking about images, I think it's really important, absolutely. And, um, you know, whenever we're putting images onto the vaccine knowledge website, we think about how... Um, you know, these images might be perceived by people. And we also um, often test our images. So we have a group of people who are interested in um, research, um, members of the public or people who may have participated in our studies before. And often if we're going to be using images to um, portray messages on social media um, or to or, as part of the vaccine knowledge website, we will send a selection of images to a group of people, parents, um, you know, people, older people, younger people, um, a range of people to say, what do you think about these images? Um, and can you make any suggestions for improvements? And I think that's one important thing that we need to, to think about with communication is, is trying things um, mm. and seeing how they're perceived before just the, going with something because you think it, it you know that's the best image um i think we need to listen to the people who are actually going to be um, responding to these campaigns and reading these articles um so that's the way we do it at, yes at obg very good there's um a little bit of discussion in the uh in in the chat box here on, on zoom about the issue of mandatory vaccines or not should a covid vaccine be mandatory if we get one helen um, well, my views on mandatory vaccination are that it, it would cause more problems than it would solve. Mm. Um, but there may be, I guess, an argument for some groups, mm. mandatory vaccination for some groups, maybe healthcare workers, Health maybe workers. people yeah. in care homes. Um, mm. That's a possibility. But, you know, you, ca you can't pin people down and vaccinate them. There's always going to be opt out <laughs> clauses. So, you know, how effective yeah. is it anyway? Yeah. Absolutely. And I think you, you both, Imran and Tanya, you would both agree with that? Yeah, I mean, it's one of the things that's weaponized by the other side is the idea that people yeah. are being able to take a vaccine. So the idea of informed consent is quite, you know, so, I mean, yeah. again, it's about positioning, it's about framing and positioning of that, which is that people have the right to say no, should they choose to do so, but most people will choose to say yes. Yeah. And I think what's interesting is in the United States, which does have a very well organized, well, well funded anti vaccine movement, they do require vaccination for school entry. Mm. And how much of that anti vaccine sentiment is the fact that you are required to have vaccination? Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Tonya, any comment you'd like to make on that? No, I completely agree. I think. Um... There's a question around whether, um, you know, mandatory vaccination is useful in particular contexts. Um, but I think for us in the UK, as Helen has already um, highlighted, we do have um, good uptake of vaccines. We have a lot of trust in our national health system. And I think if we have a strong communication campaign um, associated with the rollout of a COVID vaccine, um, then I would much prefer uh, to, to go with that method and have people making their own decisions um, and you know coming to to the nurses and GPS with questions um, and engaging in conversations uh, in order to make those decisions but I think it works much better to you know to, to have that decision with uh, the person rather than um, I think with the government certainly in the UK anyway okay we've got um, just four minutes to go before we finish and I do want to give each of you uh, 30 seconds or so just to give a lasting, a parting thought um, to our audience. So I'm, I'm going to just uh, ask one question more before I give you that uh, 30 seconds. So giving you a little bit of a heads up to think about what you want to say. Um, but this is a, 
Um, this is a question from Jeanette to all panelists. As usual, the majority are being controlled by the few. What kinds of disruptors can we consider using, um, using a non-combative uh, and in an educational way? So yeah, how do we disrupt um, the anti-vaxxers? Imran, I think we'll come to you first because this is what you must be thinking about all the time. Well, I mean, the easiest thing is the economics. And so if you look at, for example, one of our programs, Stop Funding Fake News, which seeks to target those websites which produce vaccine misinformation and are used as evidence points by others. So people don't tend to say, I think vaccines don't work because of X. They, they, they tend to show you an article and say, what do you think of this? And we target those websites that are designed to spread misinformation by saying to the advertisers whose brands appear on there inadvertently, do you realize you're funding it? And we found that within two or three months of targeting the site, we can basically reduce its economics to zero. So mm. there, are, there are smarter ways than just necessarily, you know, counter narratives. And, and we spend a lot of time in the counter-terrorism and counter-violent extremism space. Counter narratives, formers, they have, an, they have some effect, but it's mm. not the totality of it. How do you actually disrupt the systems themselves? And in part, that's also about strengthening our own systems for communicating to people. So the best thing that we can do is do is do the best job that we can at what we're doing and know that we're up against opposition and not get distracted by their loud voices. No, that's great. Thank you very much, Imran. Right, um, 30 seconds each. Um, a parting thought for our audience, please. I'm gonna start with Tonya. Um, yeah, so I think a communications campaign is hugely, hugely important um, for uptake of a COVID vaccine. Um, I think one of the key things for me um, is building trust between the public um, and the researchers and um, health professionals who are involved in this space, um, creating better relationships, having open communication, um, listening to people's concerns and addressing those concerns with, you know, the, the evidence that we have um, in an engaging and easily understandable way. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Tonya. Helen. Oh, cheating, echoing completely what Tonya said, but also, <laughs> also not having a slanging match, you know, yeah. having a proper conversation, so not beating people up. So it's about, but also we need some more noisy pro-vaccine advocacy because we don't, you know, the messages we hear are a bit weak sometimes. Mm. We really need to be out there saying vaccination is incredible. Look, they've got rid of polio from Nigeria mm. just in the last few weeks. Incredible, incredible intervention. We're almost too apologetic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Imran, final thought. I mean, I, I would again echo uh, Helen and Tonya that we need to get back to basics to why, one of the things I say at the start of any intervention I do is that vaccines are one of the safest, most effective and most consequential inventions in human history. They've saved countless lives from disability and death. Uh, especially young children. And, you know, we, we forget that sometimes we have to make the case again and again and again, because for every generation it needs to be renewed. We, politically, believe me, I, I know this from, from the, the, the referendum, that we, we failed, for example, to, to make that case for Europe again and again over a sustained period of time. In fact, we, we, we started to think about the, the internecine, the nuanced debates. Get back to basics. And, and I mean, I, I think that this is a no-brainer case, and it can be conveyed by truly compelling uh, uh, voices. Um, we, we, I think this is a completely surmountable challenge. Fantastic. Thanks very much indeed. So, Tonya, Helen, Imran, I want to thank you for being part of this. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the Jenner Museum for hosting us, and I'm going to hand straight back to Owen, who I guess will do the closing goodbyes. Thank you. Hey, that's better. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you very much to Tonya, to Imran and to Helen. And thank you very much to, to everyone who's come and joined us for this conversation. And thank you again to everyone who's put in questions, who's joined in the conversation on, on Twitter as well. Uh, and I suppose my final parting bit would be in terms of celebrating vaccines, being pro-vaccination, celebrating our success. Uh, and that's why I think Dr. Jenner's house is so important. It's the history of the eradication 
eradication of smallpox, one of the greatest success stories in, I think, the whole history of, of public health. And we've got the story from the start of vaccination right up to 1979, 1980, when smallpox was declared eradicated. And if anyone's interested in finding out a little bit more about that and the, the campaign to eradicate smallpox have a look on our website we've got um, last week's jenna conversation with david Heyman and paul fine both of whom worked on the eradication campaign sharing their views about um, lessons that we can learn for today so thank you very much once again to everyone for joining us and to our panelists and to richard horton for chairing the discussion and we hope to see you again very soon thanks very much thank you thanks very thank much you. Thank, you. thank you bye-bye